Well, welcome to First Tuesdays, and this is a program which is supported by the uh, Washington State Library, the Office of the Secretary of State, and we receive our funding through, through the uh, Library Services and Technology Act. I'm your facilitator today. My name is Carolyn Peterson, and I work for library development at the Washington State Library. And um, we are going to be um, our OFM, our technical support folks are both here. And they will put, as you can see, their phone numbers are in the um, in the chat, uh, the, I guess the participants room, the main room. And so if you have any issues, and apparently I just noticed as I loaded that Blackboard has a new update, which I imagine is what might be causing us some of the issues we've been having with, with microphones and things like that. So if you need any problems, if you can't hear us, uh, this will be recorded later for other folks who can't come in at this particular time but wish to hear the program at a later date. Um, as I said, it's brought to you by both the Secretary of State and the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which is a federal government agency. And now, if you would, for our OSM, um, the Office of Financial Management of the State of Washington always asks us to tell us how many people are at your location and what library association or what, what's your library organization and then uh, the city and state. Um, they like to keep um, that. They like to keep track, and, and they ask us to, to do that for input measures. And then we just we have a very, very, very short survey at the very end um, that our federal funders have asked us to do. And so if you would be gracious enough to stick around and do that, that would be great. And uh, so if folks would type in where they're from, JD and Wozniak, if you would do that, we'd appreciate it. And I think I see Sue. Um, typing. If JD would type as well, that would be great. Okay, great, wonderful. Okay, well, in that case, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mary Jo Heller and Irene Storms. And um, Irene is a freelance author, a farmer, and an occasional pirate. Um, I'd love to know how you be an occasional pirate. Um, she is co author with uh, Mary Jo of. Um, Sex in the Library, and Irene also wrote Endurance 101, A Gentle Guide to the Sport of Long Distance Writing, and she's still pecking away at a novel in her time away from her day job as a teen services librarian for the King County Library System. And Mary Jo is a school librarian, and she uh, graduated from Northern Illinois University, and she worked with teens for 37 years in secondary schools in Illinois, California, and Washington State, and she's also worked in Italy and India. And while she's traveling, she's still reading, and she works with any team she can find, and she harasses Arlene still at work. And so with no further delay, I will turn the program over to these ladies. Thank you very much for um, helping us with this. <laughs> OK, um, I'm Erin. <laughs> Mary Jo's already hitting buttons faster than we can use them. Well, yes, that's true, but we'll get used to this. Okay, you already heard about us, so let's just get started, Erin. Okay, um, as it says on the slide, Mary Jo started it. She bought the copy of the book that you see on the screen, Deal With It, A Whole New Approach to Your Body, Brain, and Life as a Girl. And then things went terribly wrong. Well, you see, the quick picks that ALA puts out come up in April. And in April, the kids in school are really wonky. And so quick pit picks are just what they say. They're quick to pick. We look at the cover. Does that look cool? Even the, the raincoat comes off. And they are quick to use. So if you look at them, it's a very cool guide. It's just kind of set for middle school kids, where I was at the time. Um, it has nice sidebars, lots of stuff going for it. And then it got really popular and got more popular. And so I put it on hold for myself and looked at it, and it's great. Same things I just said, except that when you get to a certain page, it talked about how to swallow. And that's not necessarily cool for middle school. So I gave it to my um, sex ed teachers, and they said, yeah, this is very cool. We talk about condoms. We talk about how to do all this. Ah, uh, no. Our parents would freak. But our kids need a whole lot of the rest of the material. So I went to Erin. Mary Jo called me. 
and to explain the situation about this really great book and how she really could not have it at the middle school, but I, as a public library, um, have a completely different mission and I could have it. So I called my book buyer at King County Library System and said, the school library locally cannot have this book, that means we need extra copies. And so we added more copies to my library and then when those copies literally were read to death, cover falling off, pages coming out, we bought replacement copies. It's out of print now, we can't get it anymore. So that led us to think, how can we work together on this? How can we work together more on this? And who do we work with? So start looking around to see who you can work with. Um, some of the books that we can't carry, the public library can. Some of the books we can't carry, the, the high school can. Who else can you work with? And that got into a collabor collaboration effort and where we go with that. Um, and what's your responsibility to the kids? If I couldn't have that book, do I just ignore it? Or do I look for somebody else to help me with it? And that led to the creation of the Sex in the Library book talks. That's where we started. And as you can see in the picture on screen right, I'm holding up um, an unreadable, it's very small print, um, copy of the mission statement of the King County Library, which basically translates as King County will buy whatever people want and need until we run out of money and can't buy anything anymore. And of course, being King County Library System, we haven't yet run out of money. So I don't have a cap on my buying. So money is not an object. All I need to know is what do I need to buy, how many copies. Um, and so my selection policy is really, really broad as opposed to Mary Jo's over at the middle school. And that's the problem. I mean, you know that most libraries and schools are probably short of funds. Uh, we also know that it's very easy to diss the books that you really don't want to have in your library that would cause you trouble. That's where you need your mission statement. It gives you some protection, it gives you something to talk to parents about, and it gives you something to talk to your principal about. So, where are we now? Well, the book, obviously. Um, and just as an aside, we did get starred reviews in the School Library Journal. Um, it is a workshop. We do this um, for other librarians, for parents, um, for about anybody who asks, for even your school. Um, and it is now this webinar. Objectives for the session. Oops, I need to adjust my mic. Um, we want you to walk away from this session with some handy phrases and words and uh, concepts so that you can speak with comfort or relative comfort about books in your collection or books that you want to have in your collection um, that have sexual content and that are written for teen readers. Um, I think probably the most important phrase we're going to um, hit is Star Trek sex, which is a wonderful concept. Um, back in the olden days of the original Star Trek, Captain Kirk would be romancing some alien person and the music would get all romantic and the focus would get all soft and then it would fade out and cut to commercial. And when we came back from commercial, Captain Kirk was pulling on his boots and the alien lady was brushing her hair. And we, the audience, understand that something happened while we were watching commercials for soap, for soap and mattresses and whatever else, but it wasn't on the, on the screen. It was not something that the censors could point to and say, there, that, that, we don't want that thing. And we see Star Trek sex a lot in teen literature, and we applaud it because it allows the readers to know what's happening without having things on the page that are going to get librarians. And we're not trying to say that you need all of the books on sexual content, but we are asking, can you talk about them? And if you can't, is there a partner who could help you? Obviously, we're not going to read screens to you. You're adults. You can read. But you do need to decide if there's a reason to have this book in, if there is, who can help if you can't have it, and isn't it really all about the money in the long run? What this webinar is not, um, we've all had the experience when we go to uh, workshops and conferences and there are three or four different things going on simultaneously and you really want the content from all of them. And so you rush into the room at the beginning of the session and you pick up the book list and you rush on to the next one, you pick up their book list. We have a book list 
it is not a list of things that you need to have. Um, it is a list of books to consider. It is a book, list of books to think about. Um, and so we will talk about, and when we review books, we tell you it's Star Trek sex, there's nothing on the page, or no, there's body parts in this book, and if that's a problem for you. And we have worked, um, we've done talks in some places where full frontal nudity is not a problem. You can have as much sex on the page as you want as long as you don't cuss while doing it. Um, so that's where your knowledge of your constituents is really, really necessary. Um, sex in the Library is not a job to do all by yourself. Um, it works as a tandem book talk. And your job after leaving here is to figure out who's your best partner. So I guess we have a tool framework here. One is we want to talk about books. We want to give you ideas about how to talk about books just by doing that. Um, and we also want to make sure that you know how to get around all of the sensors. I mean, that's obviously going to be a big part of this no matter how we'd like to phrase it. It's still something we just get to do. What we will do is discuss three topics. There are many more topics that we could do in the book. There are several topics, but our time is limited. So we're going to support just these topics today. Gender benders, obviously a huge topic right now, whether it's gay, lesbian, transgender. Caution in any way, shape, or form, whether it's sexual abuse, physical abuse, or mental abuse. Um, um, and then other worlds, which is just still and always probably will be a huge issue with teens. We are going to give you other sources to do. We're going to uh, let you in on some other things. But remember, you aren't doing this alone. Whether you're, you're listening to us, always keep thinking, who else is going to help you with this? So gender benders, transgender characters, and beyond. Oh, let me talk about George. Um, George is a girl. That's the thing you need to know about George. And this is a middle grade book. The target audience is third, fourth, fifth, sixth graders who may or may not have a transgender child in their classroom. George is a girl. She's always known that she's a girl. The parents and the babysitters and her siblings, they think she's a boy. Her classmates think she's a boy. Her teachers think she's a boy. And it's really, really a problem. George wants more than anything to play Charlotte in the class production of Charlotte's Web. But she's not even allowed to audition for the part because they say she's a boy. Um, this book is very gentle. It's very tactful. Um, because it's a middle grade book, and not a teen book. It does not need as much angst as a teen book would need. Um, there are way more understanding adults in a middle grade book than there are in teen books. Um, there are, of course, a few paper bullies who say, well, you're not a girl because I said, bleh. Um, and they are knocked down pretty quickly. The author does a lovely job of bringing George to a peaceful place at the end of the book. We, the adult readers, know that George has got a lot more challenges in front of her, but the readers, the target readers, will know that she has made progress towards her goal. This is a book that will take you as an adult maybe two hours to read maybe not even that long. It will obviously take kids longer. And at the end, one of the things that really hit us hard was that mom said, look, I'm OK with you being gay. I was ready for that. I'm not ready for transgender. And that's where a lot of people are right now. And that's why this book is important at the middle school. It can be used higher. Beauty Queens, on the other hand, is one of those books that we both loved. And very often, Erin and I don't agree on books at all. Um, it is a, a terrific book by Libba Bray, who just really had fun with this book. She incorporated 14 beauty contestants who landed on a desert island. Along this desert island comes reality TV pirates. There's a dictator. There's a former beauty queen who wants to be a president. There's a gay teen, a trans teen, a blind teen, a deaf teen, an Indian American teen, and uh, Miss New Mexico who has a tray embedded in her head. This book made me laugh out loud. This is not a book to read on public transit because the 
other passengers will think that you are crazy, um, especially if you're reading it on your phone because they just, um, there is so much to laugh at at this, in this book. And even the tokenism, the list of characters that Mary Jo just read, um, even the tokenism is being poked fun at. Luba Bray is an absolute literary genius, and if you really want to treat yourself, check out her audiobook of this book with Libba Bray herself reading the story. It's hilarious. Um, there is sex on the page on this one. There are body parts. There are buckets of cuss words. Um, and there is a great scene where one of the contestants is lying on the ground, and she's been bitten by a stingray. And we all know that if you pee on a stingray, it'll you'll get over it. None of the men, none of the boy pirates, want to do that. So one of the girl contestants comes up, raises up her skirt, and takes her penis out and pees on it. So I just want to remind you that in 2002, the Miss Canada, uh, uh, Miss Universe, was transgender. So it's a very topical book. Um, it's not a new title, but it still will make you laugh out loud. And it still makes its points. As opposed to If You Could Be Mine by Sarah Farazan. This is one of the best books to be written in a long time about um, gay teens. It is two girls who have grown up together and know that they love each other. Um, they also know that this is Iran. This is the country of Iran. Homosexuality means death. Um, gay teens can be um, killed on the street and nobody bats an eye. So um, Sahar knows that even though she loves Nazarene, she could never be with her. But when Nazarene is um, scheduled to be married to a doctor of all things, she knows that she can't possibly intervene. However, if she were a man, she could have Nazarene drop her, her uh, suitor and and marry her. It's a pipe dream. Nevertheless, in Iran, this is true. Um, if you are or think you are another gender, you can have a free sex change operation. If you're homosexual, you can be discriminated against. But if you are truly that other gender, you can be changed. So she goes to the clinic. She goes through the whole um, video. She passes out on the floor, realizing what's going to mean to her. And when the doctor comes in, the spoiler alert, it is of course course, the doctor that's engaged to Nazrin. It's a beautifully written book. Um, it, it is um, by uh, an Iranian-American herself. She has written a second book that is just as wonderful from an Iranian-American's point of view. Beautiful music for ugly children. Um, this is the story of Gabe. Uh, he is called by his family and his friends. They call him Elizabeth still, although he has corrected them. He has come out to the close family and friends. But the only place that he is really known as Gabe is when he's on the radio. Um, he runs a late night uh, public radio music program called Beautiful Music for Ugly Children. And it gains a huge following until someone outs him and says, hey, wait a minute, you're a girl. This is not a terrific book. Um, the bullies are very two-dimensional. The family goes through stereotypical. They're trying. They say, yes, we accept you for what you say you are. But they keep calling Gabe her. Um, and. It, there are way too many coincidences when you get to the end of the book. Nevertheless, there are so few books right now with transgender teen characters. Buy the book in paperback. Wait for something better to come along. As you can see, there are so many books that you should have in your library for various reasons. Do you have them? And if not, why not? Are you keeping them out? because you don't like them? Are you keeping them out because you don't agree with transgender or gay characters of any kind? Are you keeping them out for the wrong reasons? Are you keeping them out because of money? They're, these kids are looking for these books, and those are the books that we want to talk about. And uh, just to, to clarify, beautiful music for um, ugly children. There's no sex on the page. There's no body parts on the page. <laughs> that, if, if that's your fear, that's not there. The transgender character, that is there. That's absolutely front and center. Some helpful nonfiction that you should know about. Uh, feeling wrong in your own body is part of a series called Gallup's Guide to Modern Gay, Lesbian, and Transgender Lifestyles. Um, this is a short, uh, if it's 64, 48 
pages. It's not a big book. It is crammed with information that is needed not only by transgendered youth, but also their peers, their friends. The book is set up. You could write your health report out of this book. Very clear photos, very unemotional. They define all their terms. Really, really well put together. The entire series is great. Um, it gets better. It like, gets it gets better. By it Dan does get better. <laughs> Dan Savage and Terry Miller. Uh, this was Dan Savage's uh, return volley. Um, his attempt to counter a huge epidemic of gay teens who are committing suicide because they had just despaired that anything was ever going to improve. And so he put up a video on YouTube to say it gets better. And then he called two friends, and they called two friends, and they called two friends. And pretty much um, YouTube is still accepting it gets better videos. So these, the book was gleaned from some of the best videos. It's not all celebrities, although there are a few celebrities in there. Um, President Obama's brought me to tears. There were just as many good essays by people you've never heard of. And it, it's, it's a lovely book. One of the best parts of the books, I thought, was, uh, was not Chaz Bono or Bishop Robinson or, or any of the, the famous people. It was Gabriela Rivera who said, maybe it really doesn't get better. But you learn to love yourself. And, and it's those people, those real people, that kids are really looking for. Either of these books could be in your library. Um, either of these books would make uh, a, an, in, an introduction to kids that are looking for real answers. So the question is, fiction or nonfiction? What kids are looking for is reality. They're looking for how it feels. They want to know whether this is something that they're going to go through. They're looking for answers. There are the obvious answers in nonfiction. There are more answers in fiction because of how it can be portrayed. Talk to, if you're a school librarian, talk to your health ed teachers. My health ed teachers took snippets of every single one of these books and used them in class. If you're doing the core curriculum, you know that snippets are in no matter what. Uh, you can, you can do what you need to do in class and illustrate the points that you need to make with any of these books. And then kids can go and read them if they think that there's something else they need to have. But don't ignore them because kids are looking for answers and you have to have them, whether it's in your library, the high school library, the middle school library, or the public library. These are some Alterans. They're decent books. They're not fabulous books. So we're just going to leave that page there for a second. Um, in case you're worried about keeping track of, oh, which book should I have? Which book should I not have? Um, we do have the complete book list on the Sex in the Library blog. And we have that address at the end of this webinar. So you don't need to worry about scribbling down all the titles. And you can always get the webinar uh, later as well. These are stories of prostitution and abuse. These are the ones that are hard to handle. These are the ones that kids are screaming for. No matter where we are, kids are always looking for horrible stories. So Dime is a book of physical abuse. It's a book about a, a girl named Dime. Um, she is in various foster homes. She finally runs away. She is an obvious choice for the the, the prostitution ring that she's picked up by. She has, how, however, found a home for the first time in her life. She's found people who care about her. She, even the pimp that is using her cares about her, or at least appears to. She knows she's safe. She knows she's fed for the first time in her life. It's just that when you get to the psychology of what they're doing, it is pretty horrible. And Dime finally reaches out for help. She reaches out all the way through the book. You just don't realize what's happening until the very last page. When it comes to 11-year-old Lollipop, who is used by men who like little girls, the, the lack of sex is even worse than if they would actually tell you what's going on. This is E.R. Frank. E.R. Frank wrote America. Um, he wrote Life is Funny. He writes always books that are very, very difficult to understand. Uh, and The Things You Kiss Goodbye is a book about physical abuse. It's about Bettina, 
who is from a Greek family. We always talk about families when we talk to kids because their families are everything but. This is a very welcoming family. They have problems, but both of her parents love her very much. She gets involved with the basketball guy who is a physical abuse. She runs away even though she's trying, away from him, even though she's trying to do everything she says so she won't get hurt again because she knows it's her. She's not just doing it um, right. And she meets Cowboy or somebody she calls Cowboy who is the exact opposite of everything what, that her father wants. And he sees what's happening and tries to help her. It is a very sweet story. It has a very shocking ending. And it is a book that every teen needs to read. Any, any book about physical abuse with teens, you need to get them into. You need to let them read it, and girls especially. And we always tell them that this book you need to read before you get into a relationship at all. And Everything, Everything is um, a book about Maddie who has SCI. It's Severe Combined Immunodeficiency. And I had to actually read that because it doesn't make sense. She is a bubble girl. Everybody who comes in to see her has to be certified by a doctor. They have to go through a bubble before they get in. They have to be detoxed. She can't see anybody but her nurse and one school teacher who have this clearance. She has does everything else online. She is a good girl. She does everything her mother says. They have a very great relationship because this is her world, her mother and her nurse and the one teacher that comes in. And then she meets Ollie. Ollie's next door. Ollie's being physically abused by his parent, his father. She can see that. They finally get together and in um, a, a very um, wonderful moment, a very awful moment, they decide to run away together to Maui. She knows she'll probably die. She knows that she can't be outside. Ollie knows she can't survive outside and yet they both want to take this chance. It's not Star Trek 6 but it is very tasteful. There are body parts. Um, they, they are uh, very well written. And if you're sitting there asking yourself, why is she talking about this in the abuse section? Then you ought to read it. In the Alteran section, I do want to point out Poison Apples. Um, it's a book of poetry. Some of the poems are brilliant. Um, they are re retakes on fairy tales um, in which Cinderella, for example, spends the day um, shampooing and primping and polishing and all of these other things and wondering if it was, in fact, a happily ever after ending for her. And most of the poems taken from fairy tales are really quite well done, but it's a mission-driven book. It's about body image and eating disorders, and the hammer is just so heavy. So know that there are some worthwhile poems in this book. The entire book, however, is just a little too much. All the truth that's in me, notice that the girl has a slash mark through her mouth. She is a um, abducted and has her tongue cut out. That's, that's as good a starter as you're going to get for any book. Um, and just to mention that we're not ignoring movies. We don't dislike movies. We know that kids are reading movies and doing the book review. That's between them and the teacher. Um, but just offhand, do you know what the percentage of movies is that were originally books, Erin? I know, I know, I know, because you told me yesterday. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't know that it was 98% of movies start out as books. So if you are one of those, like me, who says, oh, yes, but the book is always better, you're right, the book is always better. But with every popular movie, almost always, somewhere along the line, there was a book involved. And that's an opportunity for us as librarians to connect movie viewers with books. And connect kids with books. The, there are books now about dystopia, magic, other worlds. That, those books that kids are basically clamoring for. They want, again, as, as with the books on prostitution and abuse, for different reasons, they want to know that it's worse. It's worse for them. So, so let's start with Unwind. Um, in Unwind, in the not too very distant future, um, abortion has been made illegal. However, there is a process 
um, that the government has set up that if your teenager, your 13 through 19, and later that age is dropped later in the series, if your 13 through 19 year old is a discipline problem, is just not meeting your expectations, is maybe taking up more of your time than you had originally planned and you have other things you need to do, you can send that child to be unwound, which is not the same as killing them because they are still alive but in a divided state. This is organ donation taken to the very logical, very extreme. Um, that these children are taken apart and used for parts. Their eyes may go to someone, skin may go to someone, heart may go to someone. Um, and in this book, there are three teens who are all scheduled for unwinding. They meet up and uh, things go terribly wrong. It's an entire series. This is a great series to talk about with parents, which brings us to the next slide. When you're talking to parent groups and other people with money and you are talking books with sexual content written for teen readers, you can talk about books like Unwind because what parent among us has not looked at that teenager and said, I wish there was a way to send you back. And we don't really mean to, we would like to have our children unwound. We just sort of wish. And that's where you can hook people like parent groups and say, wouldn't this be a great book for you to read with your teen? Wouldn't this be a great book for your teen's classes to read? If only we could afford to buy it for our library. I work for King County Library System. My budget is not a problem. However, that's not common. And it's not common in schools. And we've, we've talked about that before. And it's not a surprise to anybody in this group. Um, however, don't fear these books. With this book, we garnered a lot of money from our parent group at one of the schools where I was. Um, we, we invited parents in to do lunch shelving. And while they were shelving books, they were listening to what the kids were talking about. It gave them insight. They didn't fear these books. They gave us money. We're not avoiding censorship. But money can often be a ploy to say, I need more funding for these kinds of books. And then come in and talk about them. Come in and read them. Get the parents on your side. And that's, so. that's something that I always do when I get a parent coming in with concern about anything in my library. The very first thing I will start with is to thank the parent for actually reading the teen book. Hallelujah, you get a gold star. You read your kid's book. That's fabulous that you are so involved with your kid that you are reading the kid's book. That's wonderful. And I'm not being even slightly sarcastic about that. I think it's great. If you are so involved, you're reading your kid's books. Now let's talk about what you can do as a parent. And you know this stuff. As a parent, you can say to your child, I don't want you reading that book. And you can say to the school librarian, I don't want my kid reading this book. And of course, you cannot say, I do not want any child reading this book, because that's where things go terribly wrong. Um, but when, this is the part where you don't lose your job. Use your mission statement. We talked about that earlier. Find, figure out what your mission statement is. If it doesn't support what you're doing, you either need to change what you're doing, or you need to change your mission statement. Get parents on your side. We talked about that. Use other libraries. Um, make sure that the students know that you are not the end of the road. They can come to other libraries and get what they need. And now we'll return to our regularly scheduled program. So that was the commercial interruption. Now let's talk about Carry On. Sure. Carry On is a book by Ray Rainbow Rowell. You must love Rainbow Rowell. Uh, and if you don't, run out and buy all of her books. Um, Carry On is about Simon Snow. Simon Snow is the wizard to meet all wizards. Uh, he is in a wizardry school. Uh, are we kind of coming to some other book that we all know and love? This is not that book. This book has ghosts. This book has vampires. This book have, has a stupid humbug that works. Um, this book um, has homosexual tension. This book has, has sexual tension. This book has great characters. Every single one of the characters in this book is a, a well-fleshed, 
multi-dimensional character, and I can't say that about a lot of books. There are 5,000 twists in this book, and both Aaron and I loved it. And, and only Rainbow Rowell in all of the world could start a, writing a series about a magical wizard and a magical wizarding school going up against the forces of evil. Start by writing book seven. She has no intention of writing the first six books in the series. She wrote book seven, and it comes to a fabulous conclusion. I loved this one. All our yesterdays, as opposed to Rainbow Rowell's writing, which is tight and glorious and you can read bits out loud, All Our Yesterdays is not that good. However, I could not look away from this book. I kept, even when I was reading it, I kept thinking, this is not that great. Um, it's the story of M, and she wakes up in a jail cell. And she can't stop looking at the little drain in the middle of the jail cell floor. And she pries up the cover on the drain. And she pulls from the drain, even though she has no memory of ever seeing this or being here before, she pulls from the drain a long slip of paper. And there's a list of things. And they have all been crossed out except the one at the bottom. And it, there at the bottom, in her own handwriting, it says, you have to kill him. This is a story of dystopia and time travel and the paradoxes of time travel. It is not a terrific literature prospect, but I just couldn't stop reading it. It's a page turner. And if you want kids to talk about um, the paradoxes that are involved in time travel and things like that, this is a great one to get them started. There is a... Um, a romance, and in some versions of the time, that romance gets more physical than in others. Um, it's it's a really it's a very quick read, and I really enjoyed it. Brides of Roll Rock Island. Oof, I love this book. Um, this is a retake on the old Selkie story in which the um, seals come up from the sea. They take off their skins, and beautiful women emerge from inside the Selkie skins, and they dance on the shores. And almost always, there is some earthly man who falls in love with these unearthly women. Um, the women are married. You don't really think that they particularly want to be. They have been captured. Their seal skins are being held for ransom. They marry these men. They have children with these men. Um, the men leave their wives, abandon their families to go with the Selkie women. Um, and you can tell already that this is not going to be a sustainable way of life. I really enjoyed this book. I thought um, the characters were fun. The setting was fun. And of course, I loved the retelling of the Selkie story. And I didn't. I did not like this book at all. Um, I thought that the women were lackluster. I thought that they had you no know, character. I didn't think the characters were very fleshed out. Um, when the big reveal came at the end, I went, meh, what are we going to do with I this? I love the reveal. And I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to really like the Selkie story, but I just didn't. And this is kind of key. Erin and I very seldom agree on books. Um, I really love vampire books. She hates them. Um, I, I really love funny books. Not so much. Um, she, the, the kids will see you when you do dual book talking. And remember, let's go back to that. That's what we're talking about is getting together with somebody else, somebody else that can have these books, somebody else that feels free to talk about these books, and somebody that disagrees. If I stand up to a group of kids and say, I love this book, chances are they'll take it out. And they won't come back to me and say they hate it because they don't think they can differ. But when they see two adults differing, and even if you have a, a teacher in that group or another, another librarian in that group, and they say, yeah, yes, no on a book, it allows them to say that same thing. And then if you further allow them to say that about the books you're talking about, that's even more important to them. So remember why you're doing dual book talking. Also, Rans for Other Worlds, uh, Divergent, of course, is a popular uh, series of movies and a popular series of books. Um, so we don't really need to tell you about it. Daughter of Smoke and Bone is another one of those fabulous first books. I loved it. Couldn't wait for the second. Stalled out in the second book and never did finish it. And of course, my esteemed colleague loved it. <laughs> I loved it. Uh, you know, these these are chimera, chimera. They're they're um, they're they're all kinds of different beasts. 
Um, it's, it's just an amazing world that Lenny Taylor developed, and the middle book was not that good. I, most middle books are not. They are bridges to get you through to the other book, to get you to the, through to the final series. I mean, even Divergent was like that. There, there's a great reveal at the end of, of the second book of Smoke and Bone and makes the third book absolutely wonderful. Um, it, but you got to get through them. I have several kids who say, I won't read a series until it's complete because I'm, I'm going to forget the books before I get to the next one. And that middle book is almost always very. <laughs> <laughs> there it goes. Yesterday, I found another book I loved. Uh, we just lost um, Mary Jo, I think. Oh, did you drop that? I, yeah, I think I think we, I think I didn't. Nobody heard that last part, and nobody You're said right. so in the chat. So yeah, I, well, I, I yeah. Just, let you, me just let me just do. Go back. We're going to go time. back. Right. I'm sorry about that. And it's all I wanted to say was that, yeah, we're, we're, we're two, two away. So um, I just want to take, make my personal peek about series books, and that's that Smoke and Bone is a wonderful series. The middle book is not so much. Middle books are always bridge books, in my opinion. They just get you through to the ending. Smoke and Bone is that kind of series as well. The ending is wonderful, but you have to read the middle book to get there. OK. Our favorite book of the year is Learning to Swear in America. And Carolyn, can you hear us both now? We can. Thank you. OK, 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 good. just checking. Um, Learning to Swear in America. Um, love, love, love this book. It's the story of Yuri Strelnikov. And he is 17 years old uh, and a PhD in math and physics. He's Russian. He is on loan to uh, NASA because at the very last moment, astrologically speaking, Earth has noticed that there is an asteroid headed straight for Earth. And it's not one of those asteroids that's going to, you know, kill off all the dinosaurs, but it could potentially very really um, knock California into the ocean, and most of us would like to avoid doing that. So they borrowed Yuri Strelnikov. They are incorporating him into a work group that is working very hard. They have less than three weeks to try and figure out what to do so that most of the world is not destroyed. So Yuri, who is Russian, has spent most of his time um, studying. Obviously, if you have a PhD at the age of 17, you spend a lot of time with your books. He speaks English pretty well. You can tell that there are some subject verb things going on, and that makes adds to the character. What he doesn't know how to do is cuss. And when you're confronted with a problem like part of the world is going to die off if you don't find the solution, cuss words would really be handy. Uh, he meets up with Dovey, and she has potential to teach him to cuss, um, but only if the world survives. I, this book has beautiful writing. Um, when the pieces come in, and, and Yuri's looking at them, he says, the pieces come in smelling of oregano and despair. I mean, it's just beautiful writing. And it's very, very fun. It's very, very fun. I love okay. it. Oh, but wait, Squirrel, wait. <laughs> Yesterday I said, oh, wait, I have a new favorite. Um, the Serpent King by Jeff Zentner. Um, it is the story of Dill, who has two friends. One of his friends, um, Travis, he's a very sweet, sort of gentle giant who loves this series of fantasy books that's clearly Game of Thrones, although they don't call it that. Um, and he escapes from his very bad home life by just thinking about these books and pretending he's part of these books. His other friend is an upwardly mobile um, fashionista. She is, as soon as they graduate from high school, she is bound for the big city. They're growing up in Nowheresville, Tennessee, and she can't wait to get out. And so those are his friends. What Dill is, is the son of the man that everyone in town calls the pervert preacher. And the pervert preacher is in jail, not because he convinced people in the congregation to pick up rattlesnakes, which he did on a regular basis, but because he had child porn on his computer. And the whole town is sort of blaming Dill for reasons we don't know at first. Really well done. 
often compared to John Green, but truly, I'm not sure that John Green could handle the snake church. Okay. So, we understand that there's a lot more that we could talk about. There are 5,000 more books that we could talk about, but at this point, we could take questions if there are any. We can talk on forever if that's, not, if, if that's necessary. Um, but we also want to leave you with some contact information. Um, we do have a blog spot. We are on Goodreads. And we both have, have email addresses that you, where you can reach us. Carolyn? I think this is good. Do we have any questions? I see people typing. Uh, it looks like. I, I think we are good at this point. I really appreciate the, the context. And boy, you guys, for uh, copying down, for getting everything into, you did a great job of con condensing things. <laughs> oh, there's wow. our website. There we are. And I did put up the book list last night. So if you go there, you will see here is the book list. And all of the books and all of the covers are there. There are hot links. Oh, oh and we do have a There are hot links. Oh, we have a question. Is your list divided into age ranges? I'm interested in high school titles. Um, yes, it is. Um, and it is in the book. Um, in, on the website, um, we simply list what's in the book. Because that's a hard one to find. I mean, if you have sex and body parts on the page, is that a high school book? Can you use it in the middle school? It's more about the context of the book. So on the website, we, we list exactly what's in there. If your library can't have cussing, you know that there's cussing in the book. If your library can only deal with Star Trek, Star Trek sex, that's in the book. Um, it's, it's a book that's listed. They're all teen books. Where does it belong in your library? Right. And I'm going to follow the link out to Beauty Queens. Let's see if it'll go there. And then you'll see at the bottom of the review, we have these, what we call right. hot buttons, cussing, um, lesbian, satire. This is actually one Sorry, of the features that we decided not to cover when we were doing the orientation um, originally. Uh, if you want people to go with you to that link you clicked on, oh, there's a box great. up at the top that says, oh. follow me. Check that, and we'll all go along with you for a ride. Where is the follow me? I can't see it. It's up at the very Oh, there it is. I got it. I so got we it. need to click. OK. So let me go a little bit back. So we're at the section of the library. Um, sex in the library, there's our list, and then I clicked on a book review, and you can see at the bottom there are hot buttons, satire, sex, sexual decision making, uh, transgender, cussing, and lesbians. If any of those are hot buttons in your library, of course, the first thing you're going to want to do is read the book before you put it in your building. You may have to scroll down to see that. Uh, just a reminder on the web tour, we can't see where your mouse is at. Oh, sorry. OK. Um, right. And Star Trek 6. Star Trek 6, Mara, is uh, just this incredibly wonderful, useful term. And once you explain it to people, they will use it. And kids will come back to us and say um, that they, that some of the kids went to a production of Romeo and Juliet and came back and said, they had Star Trek 6 in Romeo and Juliet. We saw it there. So that was a cool thing. Other questions? <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> I, any other thing? This is just very great. And I appreciate this fact that we will be able to have it uh, for other folks who weren't able to come at this point in time. And we appreciate all the work you put into this. this well, thank wonderful. you for asking us, Carolyn. It's fun. So I, I think it's going to be. Uh, this was fun. Thank you. And um, we'll talk to the rest of you later. Um, oh. Before folks run away, though, uh, I do have a follow-up survey we'd like you to complete, please. Uh, real quick, uh, I think it's three or four questions at the most. There you go. And it's like 30 seconds, and we really appreciate it if you would do that before you leave. So thank you.